God. <laughs> well, thanks for having me back. Um, I see some familiar faces and I see new faces too. So uh, it's always a pleasure when I get to to come and hang out and um, share something that I'm a little passionate about and something that I get excited about also. So uh, as we jump in, I got it here on the screen. Um, how many of you have heard of Idlewild? Show of hands. All right. Yeah, <laughs> Idlewild in Detroit. All right. Okay, cool. Um, so Idlewild, this uh, conversation that I want to share with you today, this uh, discussion that I want to share with you is about a little community known as Idlewild. It's not that far from here. I have a map once we get into it, I promise. Um, but it essentially became known as the Black Eden. This was an African-American resort community. Um, and what we see on that landscape uh, is uh, uh, we see entertainment, we see recreation, and we see a pursuit of civil rights. So the thing that actually created Idlewild um, was uh, essentially segregation and it's desegregation that essentially kind of stops Idlewild or causes Idlewild to cease into existence. So that's just a little bit of what I wanna share with you today. So um, I am, I am just impressed with uh, with technology. If we take a look at the maps here on the screen, so we have 1831, uh, we have a map of Michigan, um, and then adjacent to it, 1859. Isn't it crazy that in, in just a few short years, um, how much Michigan grew, especially on the west side, <laughs> right? <laughs> but we can, we can thank uh, technology and exploration for that. Um, for me to just jump right in and to talk about Idlewild would be a bit of a discredit or a disservice to everything that was happening um, in that space or in that chunk of the world prior uh, to, uh, to about 1912 is where we're essentially going to land. Um, but we have to realize that that landscape was inhabited. It was, it was a place where people prayed and played and lived and fought and hunted and hung out and uh, essentially lived their lives. So, you know, we have the the, the Anishinaabe, the, the original three tribes. Um, so the Ottawa, or the Adawa, um, the Ojibwe, or the Chippewa, uh, the Potawatomi. We also had a little bit of a, a Sauk, uh, some Miami, some Fox, uh, even some Kickapoo um, in the state of Michigan. I have to say this, I'm, I'm inclined to say this um, because as I was searching for maps of like distributions of tribes in the area, I found two maps uh, that have a giant hole, like right in the center. So like right, right here um, in Michigan, a, a giant space where um, essentially uh, it says no tribe. One of them actually says no tribes here and implied that there were no Native Americans in that space. Um, in reality, in history, in the history books, I could, I guess I can do, is that what your gesture was, Ron? Like right in here, <laughs> that area. <laughs> um, I, in, in reality, in history books, there isn't necessarily any mention of Native Americans in that area. But as an archaeologist that has done surveys and studies in that area, I can promise you there's tons of uh, indigenous sites and Native American sites. So I think that's important to point out because oftentimes, even when we're talking about the civil rights movement and we're talking about Idlewild, history is typically written by the people that win. History is written by the people that have the most money to write their history. Um, and history is written by the people that tend to write things down, right? Um, so we don't know a ton about the Native Americans in that area, um, as is true with many aspects of history. So, so we have this beautiful landscape, um, and then, you know, in about the, in general, from the 1840s to about uh, 1900 or 1910, we see this mass action on the landscape of deforestation or of progress in the name of timber and lumber. For a large chunk of that time, Michigan is the leading timber producer in the nation, the leading timber producer in the nation takes a lot of trees to get that moniker, right? It takes a lot of work um, to be able to actually do that. So let me, uh, let me share with you just a little bit of what some of that logging might look like. So <clears throat> in the grand scheme of, of talking about what deforestation or sometimes deforestation has kind of a scary term, let's call it the logging industry or the timber industry, right? Um, 
uh, essentially about half of Lake County, we'll get a, a map of Lake County here, I think in the next slide, about half of Lake County is heavily wooded um, at this point in time in the 1840s, and it becomes the subject of some heavy forestry activity. So we're talking shipbuilding, uh, structures and buildings, mines. You have to keep in mind that by this time, by like the 1840s, most of the big forests in the Eastern United States have been gobbled up in the name of construction and building. And so they have to go a little bit farther and a little bit wider. They got to cast the net farther. They got to build those, those railroads longer and they have to ship all of these trees and all of these logs further to be able to maintain the pace in the clip of development. So Michigan forests are beautiful, right? Big, huge, beautiful, luscious white pines along with uh, everything else. So Michigan really becomes this, uh, this sort of hub of logging activity, and um, especially in, uh, in Lake County. So here's a little snippet um, from a, a little quote. <clears throat> it says, um, trying out these glasses I was just mentioning. <laughs> About half of Lake County in the valleys of the Little Manistee and the Pine Rivers in the northern section and the Pierre Marquette region in, this, in the southern section of Lake County were covered with a dense forest of white pines. As its territory was one of the last in northern Michigan to be stripped of its rich clothing, the transformation from lumber into agriculture, livestock, and dairy has been underway with only with only within the past dozen years. While this process is going on a county map, it may be considered fortunate that we are holding our own. So that was a, a, a pioneer in 1879, kind of reflecting back on his experience in um, what ends up becoming known as Lake County. So let's just pause for just a second, take a look at these images. So. Um, this doesn't really look like a pretty significant piece of equipment, this uh, image in the in the upper left up here, um, you know, uh, but it's 10 foot tall, right? When you look at these giant wheels, these giant mechanisms that are necessary to move these giant logs across the landscape. We got an image here from the Upper Peninsula, um, some folks, look at how many people are on this tree, right? I mean, it's a teeny tiny little picture, but to get that many people, um, and they look small even on that particular tree. One that I particularly appreciate is um, this bridge. Ron, in all your days of road commissioning, did you ever have to build something like that? Um, <laughs> so this is a fairly precarious train track perched atop a stack of logs. Um, and that's how things were transported back and forth. And then these images along the bottom, Manistee in the 1880s, uh, Traverse City in 1888, where you can see just how massive, I mean, essentially in this image in the lower middle here, these are all logs. This is a river of logs. You could walk from one side of the river, very dangerously, um, you could walk from one side of the river to the other and never touch water, right? Just because the amount of logs that are, uh, that are heading down that space. And then um, this image up here, or the, the lower is um, a courtesy of Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, but that's actually of the Upper Peninsula. So that's a, a image of what it looked like in the UP around 1911. So we have this kind of like this denuded landscape. Now you might say, what does this have to do with Idlewild? I don't get it, I don't understand. Um, what it comes down to was the land was tired in many places, especially in Lake County. The land was tired and the land as a result is dirt cheap. And that's the big kicker. We see around 1910, even into the 1920s and the 1930s, we see uh, lumber companies, we see agents that are working for lumber companies. We see uh, people that are purchasing land because it is so cheap. And then they're like, what am I going to do with it? There's just a, it's kind of a denuded, kind of a void landscape in some places. In others, it's fairly, you know, it, it went fairly untouched. But for the most part, the western side and the northern um, part of Michigan's Upper Peninsula are completely kind of void of a, of a landscape. So now let's get to Idlewild, right? So uh, you can see here, we have our little, uh, we're up here. We're uh, underneath. There's my thing right up here, there's Black River. Um, and then uh, I think we have competing arrows here. Um, and then down here, the, so this red box highlighted, this is essentially Lake County. So uh, think about Irons, think about Baldwin, think about uh, Idlewild, Yates Township. Um, this is where sort of 10 uh, intersects with 37. Um, 
And uh, now I'll, I'll pause and I'll ask, I know we have at least one person. Are folks surprised because they thought this was down by Detroit? Right? <laughs> they thought the wild was down by, down by Detroit. Um, so uh, in, in Lake County, what we essentially see is that this was originally called um, Ashium County. It was named after a, a, an indigenous uh, Native American or a chief. Um, it's renamed to Lake County in 1843. We see it settled in 1862, or at least folks start to kind of populate it in 1862. And these are essentially pioneers. Right. These are folks um, that uh, a, a comment out of one of the historical sketches. They say um, the settlers who came to this county as early as 1863 endured hardships. Um, in many instances, it was with extreme difficulty that they procured even the necessities of life. And uh, they're not so much concerned with the quality, but as with the quantity. And they are forever thankful for even the plainest of fare. The furniture and the implements of a household are of primitive manufacture, board benches and chairs, and just rough boards for tables or for platforms. That's in 1870. Um, so by uh, 1910, we really see that full transition to agriculture, kind of like the main way in which people are making money um, and living. But what's important here is um, they have this, this little statement where they say there's water everywhere in Lake, Lake County. Not only is it supplied by the Little Manistee, the Pierre Marquette, and the Pine River with their numerous tributaries, but is also stored in the little crystal lakes distributed throughout the territory, and it gushes from thousands of springs, which in turn feeds those lakes and feeds those streams. So that's in 1910. We're kind of just starting to sort of build a picture. We're starting to see a little bit like Lake County is kind of an inviting place. Lake County is sort of a, an interesting place by 1910. So we're going to pause, we're going to shift gears, and then we're going to come back to Idlewild. I'm going to talk a little bit about Jim Crow. So um, essentially, Jim Crow is a series of laws and sort of restrictive codes that were uh, put into place in the American South. Now, when we say, well, hey, we're in Michigan, we didn't really experience Jim Crow, did we? Um, we have one of the best Jim Crow museums in the country. It's actually yeah. uh, in Big Rapids, if anybody makes their way down there to Ferris. Um, but uh, it, it bled over, right? So these restrictive codes that were applied to African-Americans and essentially to people of color um, uh, kind of throughout the United States. It manifests in the North, not necessarily as... Uh, maybe as a violent or as obvious, but it was very much absolutely um, a part of, uh, of life in a Northern Michigan. So its roots are in enslavement, its roots are in human trafficking, its roots are in this kind of concept of, of what was a sort of Southern um, um, slave holding or um, Eurocentrism. Um, and so we kind of see it manifest long after the end of the Civil War, long after the Emancipation Proclamation, we see continued situations where folks aren't necessarily allowed to participate. So um, African-Americans in general in Michigan, this is just Michigan um, we're talking about, they're prohibited from voting. They're prohibited from serving on juries. Interracial marriage was illegal. In fact, if I remember correctly, um, while it was an accepted practice, I, I don't quote me, but I think it was still on the books even as late as 1993 um, in certain municipalities, right? That it was illegal to, um, uh, for interracial marriage. Uh, legal representation, so seeking representation in the event of a legal situation, oftentimes folks were prohibited from. Uh, purchasing homes, specifically in white neighborhoods. Uh, receiving loans, couldn't necessarily go to the bank and, and get a loan for something. Purchasing life insurance. So we see um, people that offer life insurance actually um, uh, stem out of African-American-based businesses. In particular, African-Americans aren't allowed to fish or hunt or boat or use public parks or public pools. They're not allowed to experience or enjoy the outdoors the way that many white folks might have the opportunity to do so. Uh, typically not allowed to view, um, this is specifically in Detroit, uh, not allowed to view properties. So you call up a real estate agent and you say, hey, I'm really interested in this property. Um, if you were African-American, then the chances are you wouldn't necessarily have that opportunity to interact with an agent. 
Um, and oftentimes, one of the things that we get really excited about, you know, our right to, to protest something or to demonstrate or to fight back against something, um, in many instances, that was also a right that was uh, denied many African Americans during the, during the Jim Crow era. Um, and so just pausing to take a look at some of these pictures, here we see um, uh, the, the backdrop, the image in the, in the back there, you see this long road, or I'm sorry, this long wall. Right, so that's a Brimwell Brimwell Wall in Detroit. This was a wall that was essentially created to separate a black neighborhood and a white neighborhood. It's still there today. You can still see it. Obviously, it doesn't um, do the same thing that it was uh, originally erected for, um, but it is a, a kind of an interesting reminder um, that that was certainly the case. And then uh, we have folks. Um, this the picture in the. The lower corner here, these are uh, women that were pushing back against African Americans being allowed to ride the school bus to public schools, right? And so they actually took that uh, demonstration all the way to Washington, D.C. That's where that picture was taken, but they were a Michigan chapter. Um, and then uh, we have the Ku Klux Klan that showed up at the same uh, type of protest. This was in Michigan. Um, and then in the center, we have some folks demonstrating for I think this was public schools, if I remember right. Um, yeah, in uh, 1963. So, um, so we don't necessarily think about this in Michigan, right? Uh, was it a uh, state law? It was by, it was by state, not federal. Sure. Um, so the question was: Was this a state law, or Jim Crow's state laws, um, or was this federal? So in the South, there were typically state laws. Um, it influenced, it didn't necessarily make laws, but it influenced behavior in the North. So even if folks had the opportunity, even if someone was attending a public school, an integrated public school, um, and had just as much of a right to ride the bus as anyone else, um, there were other people that were prohibiting and protesting that. So not necessarily diehard laws, but um, when you can't necessarily proceed with the behavior, then it's a code, we call it a social code. So, so um, yeah, I think that's it for that slide. So um, it begs of us the question then, what we essentially see happen um, in the 1912, so kind of like reversing from some of those images a little bit. In 1912, we have a, a, two couples, uh, one from Michigan and one from, um, from Chicago that say, man, that Lake County, there's some nice looking land there. And you know, we could sell it. We could do something with it. We could kind of develop it, right? So this a group of business partners essentially um, purchased 2,700 acres of land. And they have a very specific target in mind when they're developing. They know that in all actuality and reality, black folks can enjoy the same landscapes that white folks can. We see in 1912, uh, well, we especially see in 1910, we start to see people get out more. We start to see people camp for fun, right? Um, we see people uh, that are hunting and fishing and boating and leaving the urban areas for more rural areas simply for recreation. Right? Maybe it's a summer thing, maybe it's, and typically this is a, a recreation, this is an event that people of some affluence have, right? I grew up on a dairy farm. You could recreate between like one and one thirty in the summertime while you were eating lunch, as long as you had all the hay put up, the cows were fed, the calves were fed, and um, you were ready for chores to start again, like in another half hour, right? So the concept that we would, that there, that there was time to recreate, right? So they're targeting a, a fairly affluent audience, um, not necessarily, a, a, at least initially, at least um, early on, they're not necessarily, they're, they're targeting folks that have the money to actually recreate. And so they reach out through their networks to affluent black communities in Chicago, in Detroit, in Indianapolis, and in points further south. And they seek out and they advertise and they market and they even sort of enlist other people. Now we're talking African-Americans. So these are all white landowners, right? Um, they're like, hey, listen, 
the likelihood of somebody purchasing, the likelihood of an African American purchasing land from me in 1912, um, or someone that looks like me, slim to none. But if we can get some black folks here to kind of sell this with us, right, we can kind of build a recreation community. We can develop a space specifically where people can come and feel safe to hang out, have a good time, go boating, go fishing, go hunting, enjoy the outdoors and recreate, right? And so um, this is a clip from uh, one of the uh, 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 one of the brochures and the, the, on here you have an image of, a, of one of the brochures. This brochure actually came a little bit later in Idlewild's history. Um, but what we see is they parcel it out into 19,000 plots of land right, 25 by 100 feet, 20 feet wide by 100 feet long, kind of these long skinny plots of land around all the lakes and around kind of in some different um, places and they sell them for $36. You could put $6 down and then pay a uh, pay dollar a month until you had it paid off and you would essentially come to own a chunk of property. Now, this is also enticing. Right. This is enticing to a lot of people, especially in the city, because a lot of folks are renters. Right. What's the American dream? Oh, I want to have a, you know, a house and, a, and some land and a picket fence and a couple of acres. Right. Um, so the concept now that this land is going to be sold specifically to African-Americans and that um, and it's fairly economical and affordable. This is intriguing. This is exciting. And it starts to build a little bit of energy, at least initially. So this is uh, this is from one of these brochures. See if you can denote or if you can hear a little bit of the guilt in here. And I also, before I read this, I want to see who's all ever sat in on a timeshare discussion. Anybody, anybody get one of those? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So, so I right. keep that in mind. Um, if you buy a lot in Idlewild, you'll be investing your money in a growing, rapidly developing locality where it will work for you while you sleep and where it should pay you handsome profits through increased values. If you buy a lot in Idlewild, you will help, encourage, and make yourself part of one of the biggest and best and most beneficial progressive moments or movements of the day. If you buy a lot in Idlewild, you will, for yourself and your family and your friends, reap the innumerable benefits that spring from the personal contact and social intercourse with the deepest thinkers, the most active, and the most progressive people of the times. If you buy a lot in Idlewild, you will always have a place to go where you can enjoy your vacations of all time. If you, I'm sorry, you will enjoy your vacations to the fullest extent, build your health, increase your business efficiency, and increase your producing powers. If you buy a lot in Idlewild, you will not be dependent or homeless. If you don't buy a lot in Idlewild, you will have neglected an opportunity and real opportunities seldom come along. Wait, it gets better. And you will always regret it. Your children will regret it. It is better to say that I'm glad I did. Oh, is it better to say I'm glad I did or I wish I had? Act now. Right? I mean, this is, this is, you know, I mean, and, and we also have to realize this, it's not like they're flicking on the TV and, and uh, you know, there's an infomercial on or they're sitting there like, oh, I get, I get 30 bucks off of, uh, you know, Orlando tickets if I listen to the spiel. Right. Um, but rather, this is you know, they're getting something in the mail or they're having a conversation with someone and then receiving this this written literature. Folks get really excited about it. Um, and so we start to see that amongst the affluent African-Americans in some of the more urban areas like Indianapolis, Detroit, even New York, Chicago, uh, different places, they start to purchase some of these lots in some of these lands. The the it was called the the uh, IRC the Idlewild Resort Community or um, Idlewild Resort Corporation. They actually put people on trains and they like bus them or they transport them to Idlewild. Like you can leave Detroit at eleven thirty at night. You can catch a train up to Idlewild and then they kind of like put it on as this host. So you have droves and droves of people coming from the city for a weekend to just check Idlewild out and then they get there. It's only 36 bucks. It's fairly cheap. It's inexpensive. Um, this is a really good opportunity for a lot of folks. So, uh, and then helping them in many instances, what we see is that we have people 
Um, like Madam C.J. Walker. So Madam C.J. Walker was actually born Sarah Breedlove. Um, she's one of the first documented black female millionaires, right? She purchases land in Idlewild. By 1918, unfortunately, just shortly before her passing, um, well, actually she purchases in 1913, um, she's purchased land and you know what? It's almost a matter of keeping up with the Joneses, right? Anybody that's anybody now is feverishly like, oh, hey, yeah, well, Madame C.J. Walker purchased it. So she makes her, her fortune off of uh, hair care products, natural hair care products targeted specifically for African-American women um, and men a market that was not tapped at that point in time, right? You can still purchase her products today. In fact, her company, which is still going strong, um, sells exclusively to Walmart. So um, you can you can run over to Walmart and see that um, her, her products are still on the line. So she is uh, in, in this, this uh, Idlewild Resort Company, they start to enlist um, some of their affluent purchasers in kind of like recruiting more people to purchase land. And so she puts out a letter and she says, I consider Idlewild a great national progressive movement. It supplies a great pressing necessity to our people, namely a national meeting place where the leading spirits from various sections of the country may gather each year and discuss problems of national and race importance. Great good cannot help but result from such a movement. And Idlewild, being located where it is in the heart of the great resort section of Michigan, makes it ideal for the combination of business and pleasure. I have purchased a beautiful lakefront location, and I intend to build my summer house at Idlewild. And I also intend to build a school for teaching hair culture. And I expect to have the school completed and in operation by the season of 1920. She writes this on her birthday, December 23rd of 1918, and unfortunately she passes away in 1919. So while she did get her home built, she did not get that school up and um, operational. So what we see at Idlewild is a, a series of, of uh, this is sort of over the course of time, some structures that are built, but early Idlewild, especially this image um, in the upper corner here, Idlewild was, was a series of bungalows. In some places, it was uh, much larger structures, but um, the average lot had a, a series of bungalows that were connected by a narrow boardwalk um, and a window at the opposite end that faced Lake Idlewild. So each cottage had two cots, a very crude nightstand, a kerosene heater, a picture, a pitcher rather, and a, a bowl for water. Um, it had a, a, a bucket and a vintage hot plate and a thunder mug. Does anybody know what a thunder mug is? Yeah. <laughs> so a chamber pot, right? Because the outhouses are placed a little ways away. So uh, you can use a thunder mug or you can, uh, you can brave the dark at night in the woods and, um, and uh, use the outhouse. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> so what we see is with the development of Idlewild, eventually by like around 1920, 1925, this community is valued at near a million dollars, right? Just from these tiny little bungalows, these tiny little homes that are created. And then we start to see other buildings. So um, we have the Casablanca Hotel in the other corner. Um, we have a, a, a church. Um, this image with all the cars, that's a fast forward, that's the 1950s. Um, and uh, we have all these people that are still kind of selling, promoting, and, and it sort of catches, it catches on like wildfire. And now at this point, it isn't just affluent Blacks, it's, it's African Americans that have the money, that have like a little bit of disposable income, and they want to make the trek, right? Another thing that folks get really excited about is, you know, the automobile industry. Well, now all of a sudden, driving from Detroit to Idlewild or driving from Chicago to Idlewild, not that difficult, right? You can actually do that. In fact, you get there, you check into the Idlewild Motel or the Casablanca Motel, you run into somebody that you see or you know, and you're like, oh, yeah, the trip up, man. I only blew two tires, overheated twice. You know, like it's part of the culture. It's part of the culture to have a conversation about how or the weather, how hot it was or the rain. Right. And it becomes one of these sort of like bonding things um, right at Idlewild. 
So there's other really influential folks um, at uh, Idlewild, the profiles in Idlewild that I'd like to call it. So this is uh, W.E.B. Du Bois. So he's an American sociologist. He's a historian. He's an author. He's an editor. Uh, he's an activist. Um, he was part of the founding members of what we now know as the NAACP. Back then it was called the uh, Niagara Movement, eventually changed to NAACP. Um, so he has a he buys property right at Idlewild and he has a, a little house that he built and uh, this is him in the lower corner with his family and some friends um at Idlewild uh, the other images are um different places the one in the upper right is actually in uh Niagara if I remember correctly um so <clears throat> he has this particular comment about uh Idlewild that I think is um is really worth sharing he recognizes that it's kind of a weird situation, right? So here's these couple of white folks in, in positions of power that yeah. have now made millions of dollars off of affluent African-Americans. That point can't necessarily be forgotten. Um, but he has this to say about Ida Wilde. And when he says this, it's almost as if there are other people that are like, oh, you know what, WB did W.E.B. Du Bois says that it's okay, um, so I guess I'll go ahead and, and buy some land too. Um, so he says, um, no one will accuse me of over partiality towards my paler neighbors. I deeply regret that as I go older, grow older, a white face is to be a sign of inherent distrust and suspicion, which I have to fight in order to be just now. White men developed Idlewild, they recognized it, and they purchased it and they attracted colored people um, and they have made money by this. And this was their object, this was their intention, but they have not been hogs. They have not squeezed the lemon dry and they have at this point and in this point in time, they have an open square and Idlewild is worth every penny. It's worth a good deal more than most people paid for it. And the white man that developed it deserved the respect for this. For their experience, we pay a very low sum and our hats are off to the Idlewild Resort Company. So this is again, another endorsement. So like Madame CJ Walker, and when um, Du Bois writes this, it's actually a little bit later. Um, this is another kind of like attraction, right? Where folks, folks start to um, kind of come and, and hang out. So the goal of Idlewild initially is recreation. We might know it as a black entertainment community, but it is essentially recreation. It's a space for uh, people to hang out. Um, so uh, Idlewild offered the potential for, quote, absolute freedom from the desperate cruelty of the color line and for the wooing of the great silence, which is peace and deep contentment away from the white devils of America and the white souls of justice alike. That's from W.E.B. Du Bois. He recognized that this desire amongst uh, African Americans to be able to be outside and to be safe, to be able to have a good time, um, and uh, to to be permitted to do so. So here we have in early Idlewild, we have these images where um, there's horseback riding, uh, there's a tabernacle, there is a football field, there's a soccer field, there's a golf course, um, there's a boating, there's swimming competitions, there is a uh, uh, just about anything that you can possibly imagine. Um, and then of course there's winter sports too. There's skiing and there's there's um, hiking and there's uh, early photography. You could take a class in just about anything that you wanted. This is a premier elite recreation destination. Has anybody been on a cruise, right? This is a cruise on land. Right, you go here and you can do just about anything, and it's all included in this uh, in this twenty seven hundred acres of landscape. What we end up seeing during the Great Depression, so you know the nineteen twenties, the early nineteen thirties rolls along, and pretty much the country comes to a complete halt. Right, it comes to a complete stop. Um, what we see at Idlewild, in particular, is that that original affluent community that original group of the, the original purchasers of Idlewild, um, they get Idlewild through. So we see this shift from recreation. We see the shift from uh, boating, from fishing, from hunting, from pageantry, from, from all these different outdoor activities to entertainment. 
And it's done through that network, that affluent black network. And so uh, we start to see places like the Paradise Club, the Flamingo Club, uh, the El Morocco Club, which uh, was constantly hosting folks like Cab Calloway and uh, young B.B. King. Um, we see the shift also then in the people that come to Idlewild, right? So I mentioned the cars. I mentioned like, you know, now you can get to Idlewild a little bit easier. You don't just have to, you know, get on the train. Now you can actually drive to Idlewild. So we're starting to see newer and younger audiences that are really excited about the nightclubs, about the entertainments, about um, maybe some of the literary stuff, the acting, the dancing. And what's the other big thing that's happened, you know, by the 1930s? Alcohol, right? So... You can go out in the boat during the day, or you can sit on the beach and sunbathe, um, and then you can have a little have a little drink. You know, previously in in the 1912s and in the 19 teens and 1920s, that wasn't an option, right? So now alcohol is a, a factor. Getting there is a lot easier, and bringing in these popular names um, are really starting to bring a different audience or a different set of people in in droves. <clears throat> so we see this boom, this shift from outdoors to indoors. Um, and even when Cab Calloway is singing his song, hi di hi di hi So he's there singing. And then at the same time, you have an older generation that's writing a letter to the organizational heads of Idlewild saying, hey, that Cab Calloway guy, shut him up because it's like 10 p.m. And I came up here to nap. Oh I God. came up here to rest. And he's too loud. And so I'm going to complain to the people at the Fiesta Club or the Morocco Club, right? Um, so uh, we see this, this sort of like interesting um, experience between folks. Um, so we have people like Duke Ellington. We have Louis Armstrong. We have B.B. King. We have a young Aretha Franklin. Right. We have um, Fats Waller, uh, Dizzy Gillespie, Sammy Davis Jr., young Bill Cosby, really young Bill Cosby. Joe Lewis is coming to hang out and just watch. Right. Be part like the Joe Lewis. Right. Marcus Garvey, who ends up in a, this huge political broil and the, the people's president um, in the Caribbean, he's there. And he's like giving speeches and he's encouraging and he's, you know, having conversations with folks like Dizzy Gillespie and Cab Calloway and W.E.B. Du Bois. Anybody that was anybody is hanging out in Idlewild on an average weekend in the 1930s, 40s, or 50s, 26,000 people could show up on an average weekend in Idlewild. That gives you an idea of like the infrastructure that's necessary to host and to hold this many people. Idlewild grows about 300 businesses, right? There's a post office and multiple train stations. There's an ambulance. Um, there's different developers that are kind of coming in and coming out. And then you also have like new names, right? You have folks that maybe make their money off of what some folks might see as unscrupulous activities, right? Um, so you have maybe even a little bit of mafia connection coming out of Detroit or Chicago. Um, this is a place to make money. This yeah. is a place where people are having a good time, might be a little more loose with their money, right? Um, but talk about an influential hub of influential people. Della Reese, uh, T-Bone Walker. Um, I mentioned B.B. King. He's my my favorite, the Four Tops, Roy Hamilton, anybody that's anybody is hanging out in Idlewild at some point in time. So what we start to see, um, Idlewild was, was sort of often called the Las Vegas of the Midwest. Um, and there's an important conversation that goes along with that. Uh, Dr. Um, uh, ben Walker, who's, who's uh, uh, passed away since, um, he uh, made a comment where um, he mentions that um, that Idlewild is like R and R from racism, right? It's an R and R from racism. You couldn't go to Vegas. If you did, you had to go in the back door, and you had to be dressed as a waiter. So this is a hub of all these things that have some fairly significant meaning to the folks that. Um, that might live there. 
Well, what we see, especially on this slide here, so we see in 1963, you got uh, Choker Campbell, you have some, some uh, singers, some dancers, uh, a whole bunch of sideshows. You also have an amateur show and dance. Now, these were important because any of the young up and comings, this is where they get their start in black entertainment. You have to make it at Idlewild. It's called the Summer Apollo. You have mm -hmm. to make it in Idlewild before you make it in Hollywood or in Memphis or in New York City or even in Detroit, right? So you have people that are coming and like, man, I'm going to take my shot. You know, there's some big names in the audience, big time agents, Pep Galloway's here, BB King's here, right? I'm going to, I'm going to sue, say something. I'm going to do something. It's going to be my best performance ever, right? This is where they get, this is where they can take their shot. So you can see a little bit of a difference here. So the, this one image um, on the, uh, I guess that's your left, um, <laughs> is uh, uh, 1963. Um, we have the signing of the Civil Rights Act in 1964. This is critical to what happens with Idlewild. And then in 1965, the Flamingo Lounge, you know, we can still see that um, in August, they're having, uh, you know, amateur shows and still trying to, to get folks to come. It is essentially the Civil Rights Act. It is a desegregation that leads Idlewild to what we might consider to be a demise. When all of a sudden, folks now have the ability to go to the local public pool or the local public park. They have the ability to use all of those same resources that they were entitled to to start with, but never couldn't necessarily use because of these restrictive codes. Now, because of forced integration, there might not necessarily be as much of a need for Idlewild, right? It's 50-ish years old at this point in, in uh, 1964. Some of the buildings might, you know, could use a little bit of brushing up. That original affluent community is no longer around. Many of them have either passed away or aren't necessarily going to Idlewild anymore. Transportation, buses, cars don't have as many flat tires and the heat doesn't uh, stay on all the time. So now that's a little bit easier. So folks can go to different places and maybe Idlewild isn't quite as attractive. So as quickly as it sort of showed up on the landscape and then grew, it also declines. By the late 1970s or late 1960s and early 1970s, there isn't really much left to Idlewild when it comes to events like this. Now, Idlewild today is still a, a really thriving community. Um, there's a cultural center. I'd encourage everybody to go check out and see. Um, but uh, we don't necessarily, when driving through Idlewild, for me, I drive through and it kind of reminds me of, of maybe like Barton City or uh, Heron, right? Like you wouldn't, you wouldn't know that something right amazing here happened if you didn't read about it or find out about it or hear about it. Now, every story um, sometimes that we tell has a personal connection. And this one is mine when it comes to Idlewild. Uh, this is um, Lois Jean Brown Perry. She was born in uh, 1932 in Chicago. And in 1942, at the age of 10, she moves to Baldwin, which is just about four and a half miles from Idlewild. Uh, her family lives in North Baldwin. She grows up. She graduates from high school there. And in fact, just before graduation, uh, she was uh, ranked highest in her class, uh, along with another African-American classmate. Um, and they take a school trip and they go to Niagara, right, on a bus with all the other some of the other students that they're graduating with. And on the trip to Niagara, so they're going through upstate New York and, you know, through Ohio and just kind of that quick shot. Um, she has to eat on the bus. Her and her classmate are not allowed to eat. This is in 1948. They're not allowed to eat off the bus. They sleep on the bus. They're not allowed to sleep in the hotel room. And one of the most frustrating points for her was when she needed to use a restroom and she was denied that ability at a local gas station. She had to stand in the middle of a field adjacent to the highway with people ripping by and the only protection that was offered to her for privacy was her classmate that stood in front of her. And they sort of exchanged the same um, for, for each other. And she squatted in a field and relieved herself completely mortified and embarrassed. This is in upstate New York. 
right? So when we talk about segregation, you know, we talk about desegregation, um, this was a real and true thing. She graduates from Baldwin in 1948. She, uh, she, she graduated young. Um, and she uh, goes on to live in Chicago and Detroit, but she always comes back um, to the Baldwin area. And she sneaks out and she goes to Idlewild all the time, right? So in the 1950s and in the early 1960s, she's a backup singer and a dancer at Idlewild. And she's just having a great time and she's meeting all these great people. So fast forward to 1984, right? 1983, anybody remember 1983? You don't, um, <laughs> but right, 1983 doesn't feel like it was that long ago. In 1983, she decides to buy a house in Baldwin and uh, she gets a, uh, a letter from the city council Mm -hmm. And it says, um, we regret to inform you that that part of Baldwin is only zoned for Caucasians. Mm -hmm. So she uh, is kind of caught off guard. 1983. And in Baldwin, a block away from Main Street. Yeah. Yeah. So she, uh, she ends up um, making a phone call to a friend that she had met through Idlewild. And about two weeks later, she gets a phone call from Baldwin City Council. And uh, they said they're excited and uh, happy that she can now purchase that property. And uh, if she would just please uh, stop the Reverend Jesse Jackson from calling them, they would appreciate it, right? So here's this, this, little, um, this little lady, right, that just through her connections at Idlewild in 1983 was able to use some of that influence to be able to purchase a home in her child, the, the place where she grew up, right? Just in her own community. Um, she was known as Mother Perry to me. She's not my, um, not my biological mother, obviously, um, but uh, she's someone that uh, I'm, I was always very close with and I miss her dearly on a daily basis. So in closing, what I wanted to share about Idlewild is that it's not just about Dizzy Gillespie and Sammy Davis Jr. or Cab Calloway. Um, it's about being able to take a nap outside. It's about being able to hunt or to fish or to camp or to ride in a boat or to swim or to picnic or to have space and time with your family. Thanks. Yeah, it's about all that other awesome, like super cool stuff and all these entertainers. But for Mother Perry, it was about being able to buy a house in your own town that you grew up in. It was about being able to go on a school trip and being able to use a bathroom or stay in a hotel or eat a meal in the same place, right? Idlewild provided that and so much more for thousands upon thousands of people. Um, it's a place that we don't really know too much about. We don't necessarily talk about and it's not part of our normal history. So. If you go to Idlewild today, this is kind of some of the sites that you might see. The uh, Idlewild Historic and Cultural Center, great place to stop and visit. Um, uh, this is the Idlewild Hotel. I showed a picture of this in the, in the lower middle. Um, that's what the structure still looks like today. Uh, so the Flamingo Club is still standing. There's actually a lot of these structures that are still standing. You might drive by and think they look like little hunting shanties. And then when you realize who was living there in the summertime and what they were doing, it's really kind of um, an impressive space in place. That's it for me. I would love to take some questions. The little homes, are, are those still used? And do people, you know, like, is it, how, how is that community continuing? Yeah, so are the little homes still used or the, the bungalows, the, yeah. cottage, the original cottages? Yeah, so, um, <laughs> Before mm -hmm. the pandemic, uh, you could buy them off of eBay for like 700 bucks. You could buy the lot um, for like 700 bucks. They're still super cheap. Uh, you can still buy them, but you know, you're probably looking at a hand of thousands of dollars versus a couple hundred dollars. Um, <clears throat> uh, so some of them have remained in private ownership. Eventually the Idlewild Resort community was disbanded. Um, and so people just owned the land. In some instances, you know, if it went back for bad tax land or um, uh, if people just stopped using it, they fell into repair. Um, sometimes in some instances, the cabins were picked up and moved. Oftentimes they were just dismantled. Um, but many of them still exist and people still, yeah. you know, might use them on occasion. 
there was a movement of squatters <laughs> that um, folks that would come in in the winter time and stay there. And so then, you know, anybody have a cabin like in the UP or someplace and like, man, yeah, we only got up to the cabin maybe twice this year, right? That kind of thing started to happen. And so um, a lot of them fell into disrepair, but it's still very obvious, um, you know, the things that happened there. We'll go to Andrew first. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the movie Idlewild, it has a, it features Outcast, the hip hop artist. Um, it's actually set in the American South, but it talks about a lot of the same themes that was going on at Idlewild proper. Um, it's a fantastical movie, has a little bit of mysticism in it. Um, great music, same time era about, um, and it, it's loosely based on um, the Idlewild of Michigan. Is it called Loosely, it is called Idlewild. Yeah, yeah. About eight years, eight ten years ago, we drove through there. Uh, just on a lark because I read about it. It seems this seems a lot um, better preserved than I remember. Mm, yeah. Just held the ground there. Building had bushes growing all over some of it. It was so sad, but I didn't realize it was twenty seven hundred acres. Yeah. Well, was there a downtown area? Yeah, so yeah, so you're asking about like preservation efforts and, and kind of like was there a locality, like a central part? Yeah, so um Idlewild, that original twenty seven hundred acre parcel, um, was most of it was predominantly developed. Um you see some structures closer to uh, I think it's ten. Right, you see some structures closer to ten, and then um, you know there was a post office, a railroad station, um, yeah. two of the clubs, really close to the center of the uh, of of Idlewild, of the community of Idlewild. But when you drive through, and the same thing when I drive through, I, I've kind of picked the best, some of the best of the best pictures. Um, when I drive through it, you wouldn't know it. You wouldn't know that twenty six thousand people on any given weekend were landing in the middle of the woods to have a great time and you know listen to one of the top entertainers um, in the country. So there have been some pretty significant restorative efforts in the last 20 years. Um, there's an organization called Five Cap, um, the Idlewild Historical and Cultural Center. Uh, there's there's some sort of beautification and sort of like reinvigoration. The Cap Calloway Foundation hosts uh, an event there every year. Um, when Mother Perry was still around, she says to me one day, she goes, baby, come with me. And uh, she takes me out to Idlewild. We're in a barn that is just like this decrepit dairy barn. And um, uh, Mikhail Pfeiffer, if, uh, some of you, if you've watched the movie Eight Mile, right, you might recognize him from that. And um, uh, BET's and MTV's um, Def Jam's Poetry Slams was hosting an event in a barn in the middle of the woods that I'm sure <laughs> nobody knew about, right? Um, and it was just, yeah. So so things still happen there. It's still a, a lively community, but um, it sure as heck doesn't look like it. So, yeah. And um, I've been reading in the local papers that there is indeed a grassroots effort to bring it back and make it more, his, you know, kind of, not to bring it back out of the wild, but to I mean to be able to, you know, to preserve what's going on and yeah. really have had some fun right. So stay tuned. Yeah. There is a little effort in there. Yeah, absolutely. I see we have a question online and then we'll we'll grab this other one. Um okay. I'm not oh, okay. Can you hear me? We can. Hi Alice. Hi there. I ended up doing this on my phone. So I'm, it's new to me. Um, I grew up in Idlewild and I knew Mother Perry. No, did yes. you? Yes. Yes. Oh. And those pictures you had just touched my heart. Yes. Yes. Um, yes. <laughs> and you know, okay, there's always growing up there and I went to Baldwin schools my whole for all my school and I graduated from Baldwin High School just like Mother Perry but I graduated in 89 a little bit later um, mm -hmm. and uh, we always had like our I think mythology surrounding the area but one thing that I've kind of always wondered and I never knew about is the 
the white people who <laughs> the white people who uh, founded the area and then specifically marketed it to the black community. Um, obviously, they saw an opportunity to make some money. Do you know if there were any other motivations involved in that? Yeah. So you know, it was the um, so were there what were the motivations of the folks that um, originally developed Idlewild? Um, so you have the Branch Brothers and you have um, Dr. Henry Lemon out of uh, out of Chicago. Uh, the Branch Brothers were local. Uh, I think they were the local eyes on the ground. Um, I would be. I would be misleading if I was to say like, oh yeah, they were just out to help folks and they weren't out to get any money. They made money. They made good money. Yeah. Um, they probably could, they could have made more had they. That's what I was thinking. Them. Like they could have yeah. marketed it to other people and made more money. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. So all accounts. So there's a, a great resource called uh, Michigan's Black Eden. Um, that book in particular uh, really kind of does a deeper dive into those motivations. And um, it doesn't it doesn't necessarily say, and that's why I included the part from WB Du Bois, um, mm -hmm. an acknowledgement, right? Like, hey, we're yeah. buying land from some white folks and we don't, in general, um, yeah. there's, some, there's some distrust here. But at yeah. the same time, man, like... Ooh. this is a really good situation. So, you know, right. the branch, in particular, what, what we see with the Branch Brothers in particular, is, um, not just in uh, Yates Township, but in all, all the townships in, in Lake County and even in the adjoining uh, counties, they own a ton of land. And mm -hmm. it seems like they make some money off of it for a while. And I don't know if they were finally just like, enough money um, or what the situation was, but they sell. They sell out fairly early on. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And then they they kind of move on to other endeavors, um, whether it's whether it's age or wealth or, you know, some mm -hmm. deep personal passion for them to be able to offer up this experience. I'm not sure, to be honest yeah. with you. Yeah. OK, I really appreciate that. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, and Alice, I would love to connect up with you another time about Mother Perry. So, yes, same. Um, <laughs> I, I tried to send you an email that did not go okay. through before this. Oh. Um, all right. Well, maybe maybe we can get connected through all. Yeah. Do you live in Alice still, Baldwin? Someone asked in the audience. <laughs> oh, good question. Um, no, my mom still does, though. Uh, nice. And I, the house I grew up in, she just moved out after having that house for 50 years. Um it was practically right next door to where the Idlewild Cultural Center is. I live in Colorado right now. I oh. go back every single year. We have a reunion, like a lot of people have with their school reunion. Okay. And um, we just have turned it into like our Baldwin Idlewild reunion. And it was funny what you were saying about, uh, M Mother Perry taking you to the barn where where the famous people were. So we we've been trying to um, increase the different activities that are available for this annual reunion, and we had this huge dance party with comedians um, from Detroit and various places just this past summer um, wow. in the Idlewild Lot Owners Club which is a structure that's been there forever. And then er uh, earlier when you said, I don't, I, I won't talk too much, I promise. But um, when you were asking about the buildings that still stand there, we also stayed in a uh, original Idlewild cabin right on the lake oh, nice. that um, was owned by, I believe the, it would be the great granddaughter of the original owner of that cottage. Nice. Mm -hmm. Nice. Interesting, Alice. If you have photos and stuff, maybe you could do a Zoom. Um, Definitely. Presentation along with yeah. her to uh, have a good time. Uh, Definitely. And I would love kudos, to do that. Yes. Kudos to Baldwin School. They're one of the few schools um, anybody that graduates yep. automatically gets a scholarship. And yep. I, I now, they did not that. have that when I graduated <laughs> from oh. there, but we're, we're a promise school. The other thing, you know, when the income went out, 
we ended up being the the poorest county in the state of Michigan. That was our claim to infamy, basically. And I'm not sure if that's still the case, but for many decades, we were the poorest county in the state. It so it is. I actually just checked that this morning. Um, okay, it it is. It's a, the poorest county in the state, and that includes the UP too, which sometimes likes to think that they're not part of the Michigan. Yeah. You're right. <laughs> Question right here. I lived in Big Rapids for three years, yeah. Yeah. and I'm sure I died a while. But how did I get there? <laughs> so you would have taken 10. Yeah. Um, most folks take 10. Um, and before you get to 37, probably about four miles before you get to 37, oh, there's a handful of roads. There's a Martin Luther King Road. There's, um, I think there's Idlewild Road. Um, yeah. And, and you actually go south um, off of 10. And uh, it's, it's only about eh, four and a half-ish miles from from Baldwin proper. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's close, but like I said, most folks drive through Idlewild and don't realize it. There's now a very large sign too. Okay. I'm going to stop talking now. Okay. <laughs> well, I have a family member that lives in Lake City. Oh yes. Yep. Yep. Debbie Fisher, my okay. Yeah. And not I that far. Idlewild sits in to, to Lake City. So Lake City would be uh, Idlewild. I think Lake City is east and a little south, or is it north? Oh no, it's north. Yep, east and north. Haven't been over there. It's a place to go. Yep, it is now. Now that you know, bus trip. Yep. Any other questions for me? Yes. Connection. How did I get there? How did you get there? So I was born and raised in Harrisville, um, <laughs> but uh, I started working for the U.S. Forest Service um, right out of college, and uh, I worked at the uh, Baldwin Ranger Station of the Huron-Manistee National Forest. So the Manistee National Forest, which is the west side of the state, the Huron-Manistee is the only national forest in the Lower Peninsula. Um, the Manistee uh, National Forest doesn't come into, into being until the 1930s. Um, versus the Huron side, which is here on the east side. So if you go down, you know, anywhere in Oscoda or Harrisville, even parts of Ossinique, Powas and further west in Mikado, or um, to Mayo rather, all that landscape um, actually came into the National Forest System in the early 1900s, 1903, 1904. Um, so I, my first job, I was a archeologist and a firefighter in Baldwin. And um, the I walked in on my very first day and Mother Perry was at the front desk mm -hmm. and um, pretty much served as an anchor for me for, um, uh, it's interesting, you, you meet people and you didn't know you need them in their life, or you, you didn't know you needed them in your life, rather. Um, and uh, I, I stayed with her, I babysat her dogs, Peanut and Bingo, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I learned so much from her. And um and was devastated when we lost her in 2020. But yeah, so that was my connection. Baldwin was kind of my first um, big girl job and uh, has a kind of a special place. You did realize that if they do really do serious preservation work, they probably need a couple archeologists. <laughs> I've told them that. I've told them that they need archeologists to really do some preservation work. So yeah, <laughs> let's go. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Thank you. So Alice, I'm going to leave my information here with all and I would and maybe we they can exchange it with you. And um, wonderful. I would love that. Yes. Um, awesome. Because the, the link that I have to your email did not go through. So okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Well, it's been great presenting with you, Alice. I've really enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That was wonderful. I'm impressed. I loved it. <laughs> All right. Have a great day. You too. Bye-bye. <laughs>